Iowa. And also that for some reason out here with football scheduling, the University of South Alabama seems to always be on TV playing football. So <laughs> I don't know how that happens, but uh, it's easy to be a Jaguars fan here. Okay, let me ask everybody today, uh, how many of y'all are in marketing? How many of y'all are in management? Okay, uh, accounting, okay. finance, information systems. Okay, so we've got the whole college. Did I leave anybody out? Okay, well, uh, I guess the uh, ideas that I, I'll share today are uh, anchored in marketing, uh, but I will explain uh, these concepts uh, to you. Sustainability goes across you know, the entire uh, campus and it's, it is a societal uh, endeavor. And so I'll be sharing more about that with you. So I'm just gonna go to my slides right now. Let me see if I can, do I have the screen now? Can you see them? Yes. 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 yes, we got them. Okay, great, great. So you should be looking at my first slide here, integrating sustainability in the marketing curriculum. And uh, this image here is one of the perspective covers for uh, the second version of my book, which is uh, called Sustainable Marketing, a Holistic Approach. It's be published by Sage uh, in a few months. And uh, let me see if I can... Okay, good. And I was the Journal uh, of Macro Marketing Editor for uh, four years from 2016 to 2019. Macro Marketing Journal has been uh, in existence for 40 years. And it was founded by a group of scholars in 1976. Actually, the journal came in uh, 1981. But the, uh, uh, the scholars started meeting at the University of uh, Colorado Boulder for a summer seminar. And there were about 30 of them that met. And basically, they were uh, not satisfied with, I guess, the current thrust in uh, business academia, which they thought was giving too much focus to merely making profits. And they thought that some a broader uh, view of business and the role it played in society should be uh, developed. And so they came up with this uh, concept of macro marketing. And macro marketing is uh, defined as a, taking a systemic or a systems view of the interplay between marketing and society. In a lot of respects, uh, it, kind of, it mimics sociology or it's an analog to sociology, which looks at higher levels of aggregation. Now, uh, when I was editor, I was, uh, it came to my mind, why don't we have more sociologists like submitting articles to our journal. And so I actually sought out some academics, uh, marketing uh, academics who had a sociology background and they both happened to be at Northwestern University <laughs> and I scheduled phone calls with them and I asked them, where are the sociologists? And they smiled and said, well, in the 1960s, when our faculty members were coming through and our advisors, uh, the College of Business or business in general was regarded as evil and the College of Business or the School of Business regard, was regarded by these people as the temple of evil. So marketing people in the College of Business would be regarded as priests or priestesses of Satan. So there is this demonization that occurred over in other parts of the campus, but still the, the concepts uh, about taking a larger view here and looking at marketing systems such as uh, strip shopping centers, our shopping centers, our supply chains, our business ecosystems, uh, those are increasingly more important. And in this era of uh, being networked, the implication for studying phenomena related to higher levels of aggregated businesses working together is more and more important. <clears throat> so about a hundred years ago, uh, Marketing was in its infancy. Most business disciplines were, I guess, with the exception of accounting. But the, uh, uh, the, the big topic then for academics was in what role does marketing play in society? At the time, the Russian Revolution had been launched and the Russian Revolution was launched with a presumption that 
finally human beings will organize provisioning in society. There's no longer a need for allowing the randomness of a marketplace to do that for society. Uh, and the Russian Revolution, although they were suppressing information at the time, they were having you know, remarkable gains in economic growth. And turns out their economy was well suited to wage a war against uh, Nazi Germany. <clears throat> Uh, also at that time, there was the middleman uh, that was a, a phenomena that was hard to explain for marketing scholars. So why were middlemen increasing in number? Are we doing something wrong? And by comparison, you could see to the Russian system, the Soviet system, they had eliminated all the middlemen. And of course, now we realize that middlemen are a sign that your economy is improving. And so people have different tastes and preferences. And so those middlemen provide different services of bundling and selection and routing and uh, also information. And so we see that with uh, Amazon, which has now created its own platform, but uh, they know what our tastes are based on our history of searches on the website. And so they're serving up to us suggestions and even emails if we uh, you know, select to have that sent to us. So at the t 100 years ago, the middleman was a, a worrisome phenomenon, but we still hear uh, advertising say, we've cut out the middleman. But uh, anyway, it was a major phenomenon there. And also this, uh, how, to what degree would uh, society be organized with a uh, directed marketplace? Now, the uh, six dimensions of macro marketing have developed over these uh, probably the first 20 years of macro marketing's existence. And so they became sub disciplines or sub areas of uh, macro marketing. And these were quality of life studies, uh, ethics, the natural environment, systems, history, and poor countries. And so when you put those together in an acronym, you have on a, on a cross an acrostic, you have queenship. And so the queenship uh, acrostic here maps onto what uh, one of the leading scholars of marketing strategy proposes as the future of marketing strategy. And so Raji Srinivasan, who's at the University of Texas at uh, Austin, uh, she says that uh, healthcare is important to strategy's future. Income inequality, again, is important. Uh, and those two map on to quality of life issues in macro marketing. Privacy is an issue, particularly with uh, the digitized uh, environment on the internet. And there are ethical issues that are just go right along with this, them that are huge. And Facebook is a good example of that. And they struggle with, I guess, basically, as Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple says, Facebook has made products of their customers. And Apple would never make products of their customers. So uh, Facebook is doing that through following you on the internet and knowing where you go and search and then targeting uh, advertising to uh, you. They don't sell your information and it allows them to sell a premium uh, of advertising for, for businesses that want to encounter you at the right time and place with their message. Uh, the natural environment is a direct analog here with uh, what Raji's uh, talking about. Then the systems and history, collaboration, sharing economies, understanding how those have been done in the past. And then finally, poor countries here in macro marketing and emerging markets. And so when you step back and look at what she's saying, really it maps on directly to macro marketing. So it could be that the future of marketing strategy is macro marketing. There are leaders in the field of marketing. Uh, Philip Kotler is one, his textbook is textbooks. He's written hundreds of books. Uh, anyway, he's uh, recently retired at Emeritus at Northwestern University. His books now are about confronting capitalism and democracy, very much in line with uh, a macro marketing uh, approach. Bob Lush, he was recently, he was at the University of Oklahoma at TCU and also the University of Arizona. He developed a service dominant logic which really is taking a look at why or how uh, human beings do deals with strangers. And really what he's saying here is in this time of a networked world, 
uh, it behooves businesses to do things with customers as opposed of doing things to customers. So it's more of a dance that marketing and businesses are doing with customers as opposed to uh, imposing their will on uh, customers through heavy advertising or promotional activity or whatever those uh, uh, elements used to be in the marketing mix. Russ Belk, he's at the University, uh, York University in uh, uh, Canada, and he's written actually in the 1980s, this book, Consumption and Marketing, very much has a societal approach and it's, it's about really culture and how it influences marketing. In the realm of what we call consumer culture theory uh, here in the do domain of marketing, and this is uh, kind of a hip area where a lot of qualitative research or ethnography is used to understand consumer identity projects in particular. So basically people using consumption to define themselves. Uh, Soren Askegaard, uh, a, a Danish uh, scholar, uh, he's written a piece that appeared in the Journal of Marketing Theory. And really what he's proposing here is that where do consumers get their ideas for their uh, consumer identity projects? What informs them about what is cool and what they might do to become cooler. And so really he's saying that uh, it's time to expand the view and understand this context of context. And so he's really calling these qualitative researchers who have typically been very focused on micro issues of consumers to look at the broadened uh, landscape of society and culture and how that informs uh, individual behaviors and consumption practices. <clears throat> in the realm of uh, business practice, uh, Ram Sharan uh, is a well-known uh, consultant to CEOs. A.G. Laffley <clears throat> was a two-time CEO for Procter & Gamble. Uh, their book, The Game Changer, really uh, talks about the importance of leaders of businesses standing on the bridge of their ship and looking out on the horizon and seeing where the shoals are, the shallow waters and also the storms. And so it's really very much about taking an external view and they call this business acumen. So if you're able to uh, interpret uh, or gain insight about how your business can make money based on what's going on outside your firm in the realm of business practice, that's referred to as business acumen. So I think you can understand this external view that macro marketing has taken is very much in line with uh, scholars who are leading in our fields and also uh, in business practice. For examples of firms that have uh, embraced sustainability, a Danish firm here called Novo Nordisk <clears throat> is a good example here. And they really focus on insulin uh, diabetes treat treatments really is what they're focused on. They're a global firm <clears throat> and uh, they are actually run by a foundation. So that foundation has been very influential in guiding them to more sustainable and sustainable business practices. And this black line here on the uh, chart here that goes, it's actually the last 10 years of their, uh, uh, since 2010. And it's comparing uh, their returns to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And a reason that I include a chart like this, uh, and I do have them sprinkled in my book, is that in teaching uh, MBA students uh, sustainability about 10 years ago, they were very concerned that if you actually took a broad view, you would, and you did green, fielded green products and had a social conscience for local communities that basically your profits would evaporate. And so <clears throat> this chart shows that this black line is actually keeping pace or actually exceeding the stock returns uh, for the market, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And so that's important to uh, showing uh, skeptics of uh, sustainability that there is a business case for uh, sustainability. <clears throat> now, uh, important, uh, let me first ask uh, before we go on, do you have questions about what I've covered so far? Okay, if, if not, let's just continue on here. So uh, taking a stakeholder view, uh, so understanding that you know, typically uh, 
I guess traditional marketing is focused on a dyad of the business and customers. And you know, actually other business disciplines are even more restricted. So the cus- marketing researchers and marketers continually have had to coax and goad <laughs> business people to remember that the customer is important to everything that they do. And so that's been you know, decades and decades of that uh, project. But now in the realm of sustainability, we're really going to <clears throat> uh, five primary stakeholders. So you do have the customers in the center here. You do have the owners or the investors of the uh, firm here, but you also have <clears throat> the employees of the firm. You also have upstream suppliers or partners uh, are collaborating businesses. They might be in alliances, for example. And then you also have society and communities. So those societies, partners, investors, customers, employees, the acrostic here is SPICE. And so this brings to mind the top selling girl band ever, the Spice Girls. And my daughters who are now 25 to 35, they remind me that yes, dad, they were very cool, but they were cool when we were five years old. So anyway, they are still there and their records are uh, uh, still have yet to be eclipsed in terms of uh, album sales. So now when we broaden the view from the uh, primary stakeholders, we go to the st- secondary stakeholders. <clears throat> and here you can see that non-governmental organizations would be here, <clears throat> competitors, media, government, and then future generations in the environment. So of these secondary uh, stakeholders, what are, are there any surprises for you that some of these stakeholders would actually be a, presented as secondary stakeholders of a company? Well, you might say competitors, okay? And so, but you know, when we look back to the economic crisis of 2008, really that was, came from businesses, financial lending institutions in particular, in Southern California, in Florida, Nevada, Las Vegas, Arizona, they, drop their standards for lending. And basically their thought was, well, if we don't lend to this undeserving customer or risky customer, our competitors will. So really they lost sight of the importance of competitors and basically industry standards. And the result was uh, a near disaster for the United States economy and actually the global economy. And so we had a, a dodged a bullet there. Uh, there is an, uh, another uh, thought here on these secondary stakeholders, and that is <clears throat> the future generations in the environment. This is the only stakeholder of all the ones that appear on the screen here that actually cannot be present at a board meeting for any company. And they can't come to your office either and talk to you about their issues. So the future generations haven't been born yet, and the animals out there in the natural environment can't talk. So somebody needs to represent them. A lot of times that's been uh, environmental groups. <clears throat> okay, so uh, as we come to, uh, I guess this uh, stage of the presentation, I just wanna uh, urge you to, as a researcher and in your own research, and this could be in accounting, uh, finance, any of the business disciplines, when you get that revise and resubmit, usually invariably, the reviewers are asking you to please explain more about what your research means for researchers out there. And really what they're calling you to do is to put your research into context. And so that is very important so that readers of your articles can understand how they can use the knowledge that you've presented in your research papers and articles, but also that uh, uh, it just allows uh, a, a quick, you know, scan of the relevance of your work. And a, a great way to do that is to cite the journal Macro Marketing, because for 40 years, very smart people have been focused on issues with regards to uh, society and how businesses influence society, how society influences businesses, 
taken a systemic view here. And so if you just did a Google Scholar search and whatever your article is about, it might be on uh, uh, archival research in accounting. If you included macro marketing as a search term, are you with that? Are you included the journal as a specified place for your search? You will come up with hits on that and will help you ground your research and help your readers. And I've actually, I know that's the truth because in writing uh, my book, I did that in every chapter and found that to be the case. And so it's really, it was um, kind of like going through a museum, some of the older research, but it was very timely. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm gonna transition now to uh, a working paper that's uh, targeted for the journal Marketing Education here. And the, there's a special issue coming out. It's called Hacking the System, Sustainability to Macro Marketing and Macro and marketing education. Uh, the editors, special issue editors, uh, young scholars from Australia and the United States, uh, New Zealand, really what this idea is hacking the system, how to get sustainability and macro marketing, <clears throat> macro marketing uh, more directly into the marketing curriculum or the curriculum of our business schools. <clears throat> So the ideas that I will share now are coming from this working paper. <clears throat> so uh, a topology of business sustainability, uh, and I'm borrowing this from uh, uh, researchers Dillick and Muff of 19, uh, correct, 2016. They propose that there's you know, like three stages of business sustainability. <clears throat> the first is business sustainability 1.0. So this is sharehold value focus. And so, this is really like my MBA students 10 years ago. <clears throat> if I could convince them that taking a green approach to uh, business endeavors resulted in greater profits or lower risk, uh, they, they would be very interested in that. Otherwise, they really were not interested in it. Um, so this would be a, yeah, a, an early stage uh, version of business sustainability, which still is uh, probably the, the more prevalent uh, version of sustainability out there. So this would be a, a weak sustainability. Sustainability 2.0 would be firms taking a triple bottom line focus. And they would actually be folk making, uh, I guess, achievements for these three different areas, people, planet, profit. Here it is, uh, society, uh, environment, and economy, uh, this little, a Venn diagram to the right with sustainability, that green portion right in the middle. So they would actually have deliberate goals. It would be factored into their strategy there. And these firms would be taking a triple bottom line approach. And then the sustain, business sustainability 3.0 would be firms shifting their focus to society's wicked challenges. Some of these challenges might be climate change, migration, corruption, water, poverty, pandemics, uh, in any of these. And then there's uh, a number of others too that really it's not, it, it takes an ensemble of players across society to address different parts of these wicked challenges in order to show any progress at all. So three different uh, levels here of business sustainability. So you might ask yourself, well, hey, is anybody doing business uh, sustainability 3.0? And there are companies like Patagonia, the outdoor garment manufacturer, and they are leaders in sustainability. And actually, uh, they say that the, their firm wouldn't exist if it wasn't to benefit the natural environment. The firm is privately owned. It's owned by Yvonne Chouinard, who actually started in the 1970s as a blacksmith, if you can believe it. <laughs> so that is one of the things that we would tell our students, don't pursue uh, an industry like that. Well, he started making pitons and then chocks for uh, mountain climbers. And then that <clears throat> he morphed over into uh, outdoor garments. And then we have the Patagonia brand as we know it now. So uh, when this idea of a benefit corporation developed about 12 years ago, uh, Patagonia was quick to embrace it. And so really what it means is that uh, uh, they are signing on for transparency that in these different areas here, and you see them to the right, the environment, workers, customers, community, and governance, that they would be rated. There will be protocols that they would uh, 
be judged by by the B uh, Corporation NGO, and that they would have a rating, you know, that would be updated regularly. So their rating here is 152, which is very positive. The median score here is 55. So, and with regards to the environment, you can see that they are off the charts, so to speak, with regards to the natural environment. But one of the things that Patagonia has done, and they exemplify uh, what a business sustainability 3.0 firm could be, is they consult readily with other companies, particularly about sustainability uh, uh, endeavors. Walmart uh, is a partner of theirs, not for distribution of their garments, uh, but for just uh, sharing knowledge that Patagonia has about how to pursue sustainable business practices. And so it's been about 10 years that Walmart has been working with Patagonia and the scale of operations for Walmart is such that uh, Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of uh, Patagonia says, if they do even a 10% of what they're proposing to do, it will have a dramatic impact on the natural environment. And they are, uh, Walmart is doing that. <clears throat> okay, and so we're now at a time that in 2019, the Business Roundtable, which is basically a group of <clears throat> several hundred business CEOs, corporate CEOs, they stepped back, looked at things, came up with a statement and basically said, and they all signed on, and I think it was like 188 that signed this, and I think only a couple did not, but they said that shareholder value is no longer everything, so it doesn't dominate every aspect of business. And so this was quite a statement. And so of course, skeptics say, well, we'll see, you know, if hard times come economically, but uh, it, it was a, I think a watershed moment in business where there was a, a shift and, and it was a shift to, you know, working with your board of directors uh, and just saying, well, regardless of these legal uh, suits that we're involved with and the, the risks that they impose on us in the future, we did make profits this year and exceeded your goals. So that's no longer, these CEOs are saying uh, acceptable. Uh, at the same time this year, General Motors announced that by 2035, they will no longer produce internal combustion engine automobiles. So they're cars will have no fossil fuels, no tailpipe emissions. And so this is an, also a remarkable statement uh, for a company like this. Tesla, the uh, electric vehicle manufacturer, had the highest automobile sales in uh, California in 2019. So uh, uh, it's things are changing. So when we come to the uh, schools of business out there, our colleges of business, we look at the 2020 guiding principles and standards for business accreditation. Very prominent in these guiding, 10 guiding principles is societal impact. Now my school, the University of Wyoming, just two weeks ago, we completed our uh, initial uh, review for, we were one of the first schools to take on these 2020 guiding principles and standards for business accreditation and when I looked at them closely and I looked at how we were evaluated and what the University of Wyoming proposed, it became evident that it all depends on how the school defines societal impact. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're schooling your students in triple bottom line approaches to uh, doing business. It just means that if you define societal impact in certain ways, then you can evaluate your performance as a business school in those certain ways. For example, if the University of South Alabama said, our major priority is that our students would be hired by firms in uh, Mobile, Alabama, and there are some reasons for you to do that. And, and if you ignored the rest of Alabama, and you just said, that's what we want to do, and then evaluated yourself accordingly. According to the AACSB, that team would evaluate you based on what you proposed as your societal impact. <clears throat> I mean, they might leave some comments like, maybe you should expand to all of South Alabama. But still, if you wanted to define your 
strategy and goals uh, as just employment for your students, uh, you could do that. <clears throat> so now when I think of this, I think that, oh my goodness, you had a touchdown AACSB and you dropped the football. And so I, I just, I'm shaking my head. But then, you know, actually on thinking about things uh, further, I, I realized that, well, I think AACSB has probably done a favor. They have not created a mandate that business schools would need to teach sustainability per se and teach it according to a triple bottom line approach. Our, encourage firms to follow in the footsteps of Patagonia. It is opt-in. So business schools, leaders, professors need to make their own decisions about things and then looking to what would be better for their students, their programs, their communities, they need to develop their curriculum accordingly. <clears throat> So while initially I, my first reaction was, oh my goodness, you dropped a touchdown, it was right there. Uh, by leaving it as opt-in, I think it, it bodes better for long-term, uh, I guess, embracing and adopting of sustainable uh, concepts uh, for business programs. Uh, any thoughts I wanna just share? Okay, I just have a few more slides and then we can discuss at the end here. So, you know, this also comes at a time here when uh, this, we have a lot more protocols in place for pursuing sustainability. Uh, the International Standards Organization, ISO, we're familiar with them with ISO 9000 standards for uh, total quality management, but also they have ISO 14001 standards for environmental protection. And those have been there for 10 or 15 years at least, uh, continue to be refined. There's also a ISO 26,000 on uh, basically uh, triple bottom line approach to business. So that's there too. The United Nations Development Program has developed uh, their second version of what are now known as uh, sustainable development goals. And there's 17 of them here. And I just came across a, a book from Mir Miriam Sadibi. She is from uh, Unilever. She's from North Africa originally, but uh, a leader in Unilever. And she says that uh, really any business could take any of these 17 sustainable development goals and fashion that into being a purpose of the business or one of the purposes of the business. So I think you can see that um, Patagonia really has done that with regards to environmental protection, so probably climate action, number 13, life below water, 14, life on the land, 15. So that's where Patagonia has chosen. Coca-Cola has chosen actually one of their, they've got like three or four, uh, one of them is gender equality. And they say half, at least half their customers are female. So it behooves them to make sure that women are educated in all places across the world, that they're not uh, systematically oppressed or demeaned and wherever they might find themselves. So uh, that's one of the uh, uh, sustainable development goals for the Coca-Cola company. So I, I think if you follow that, and you could probably use in your own classes uh, in helping students understand the relevance of these uh, sustainable development goals, you could assign them to be uh, a CEO or senior exec in any company that you want to choose and then have them target one of these 17 and then develop a, a connection or a purpose statement that the company could uh, integrate into their plans. You can also do this for the University of South Alabama too. So you can choose one or more of these sustainable development goals. And we exist here to be about this as well as it's one of our goals, let's put it that way. It also brings up uh, here this uh, uh, the idea of paradox. So I guess to, let's say just Hardcore environmentalists are, you know, people that uh, are not fans of the school of business, uh, that the idea of sustainable marketing is an oxymoron to them. They, they see great paradox here that uh, if business has played a central role in degrading the natural environment, for example, then marketing was right there selling 
all the product or are developing those kind of products to uh, customers and it went unchecked. So there is this paradox, you know, can, I guess, marketing, one of the uh, uh, areas of thought that actually has propagated a, uh, uh, you know, profit over all uh, approach to business, or at least it was silent many times, you know, when that idea came up, that could it actually be now useful in helping business shift from profits to have, including more of a service to others. So that's the paradox. But I actually, I think there's real opportunity here. And again, I, I, I think that sustainability as it's taught probably in schools of in, <clears throat> environment and natural resources, it's all about the right side of the screen. It's all about the earth. This dollar sign over here on the left, that's left to somebody else or whatever. They don't deserve the profits anyway. But I think this tension, which actually my first students, my MBA students, their knee jerk and raw reaction to sustainability are taking a triple bottom line approach to business was, if you do that, you'll lose all your profits. And years on now, I do see that that, that is a valuable tension to continue to work with because, and I think marketing is well uh, positioned to work with that because of all the areas of the College of Business, marketing is the one that is really focused on how to make money. Uh, all the other disciplines assume that somehow money is made. So in that way, I think marketing has a special role here in continuing to like Walmart is doing, looking at what can be done with regards to making their firm uh, more environmentally uh, friendly and protective. <clears throat> and they do that through their, they have the largest independent truck fleet in the world. And so just the routing of the trucks, the, the sourcing of the trucks and what they insist is there with regards to the trucks can have a, a big impact on uh, efficiencies but also I think they're moving to finding ways using information so that you'd walk through a Walmart store and your app would signal you to how healthy or green these products are that you're walking past on the store shelf. So that could be in the future, but again, I think that you know, there's the real benefit and value here and uh, the companies that are wrestling with this are the ones that are gonna, and I think that's for your executive uh, MBA students, your PhD students, your MBA students and your undergrads, this is an exciting area. This is not easily resolved. And if you just dismiss it by saying, well, we'll just do it the way we did 40 years ago, that's not really going to succeed in a networked world where your competitors are coming out with different green versions of products and things. So the issues in sustainable marketing uh, that will be unfolding in the future, the definition of sustainability, it's this triple bottom line is embraced, but there's probably 40% of the published pieces out there in the last 10 years have used a different version. And some of them mistakenly use the sustainability and refer to it as just durability. And sustainability using a triple bottom line approach is no, it's durability as a result of succeeding in those three realms of people, planet, and profit. So that's different. Another issue going forward is uh, how do you weight uh, people, planet, profit? Uh, I've done a study here uh, nationally. It's being published in the uh, journal Sustainable uh, Production and Consumption. It's a, actually an engineering journal, but they respondents from the U.S. Uh, definitely uh, gave more weight to the planet in terms of their support for sustainable businesses than they did people. But that was two years ago when we collected data, we had a very tumultuous summer uh, last year and uh, maybe a new way of thinking about things and racial issues in our country. So I would think that probably if we remounted that study, the uh, people dimension would be higher of importance in connecting with support for sustainable businesses. And again, that's an opportunity for us to measure and conceptualize about, but it also suggests that those weights might change over time. And right now, I think the originators of the triple bottom line concept, 
it was beyond them. I think they just said, yeah, you should give equal weight to all three, but that really is a too simplistic of an answer. There's a time to mention, to emphasize, there's also maybe your business like Patagonia, you choose that you're gonna emphasize planet above the other two. Uh, timeline for sustainable business upgrades. So how long does it take to move from business sustainability 1.0 to 2.0, from 2.0 to 3.0? And then uh, the importance of a holistic approach in doing this. So uh, in other words, it's not just like flipping a switch here. If you did that, that would be uh, leading people in the wrong direction. So really, I think your students and your business people know it's it's a transformation of business and a variety of elements have to be taken into consideration. Uh, curriculum integration, this gentleman here is Bodo Schlegelmich. He teaches in Vienna at one of the uh, well-known business schools there, uh, the Vienna Wirtschaft uh, uh, School. And anyway, what he's come out in the Journal of Marketing Education last year with this article, Why Business Schools Need Radical Innovations, Driver and Development Trajectories. So basically, the, uh, his ideas are that, uh, actually, he says in Europe, students are demanding sustainability education. <clears throat> so business schools are shifting in giving emphasis to that. Uh, in our own country, elite schools, the Stanfords, the Harvards, uh, the Northwesterns, you know, they, there are sustainability programs and they are well-funded and they are leading lights. Um, there are some other schools that have chosen to do this. The University of Vermont has a sustainability MBA uh, but then I think it's more of a scattershot effort after that, and maybe a lick and a promise, M much more could be done. An issue comes up, uh, should a school business focus on uh, diffusing sustainability through all courses or a lot of courses, uh, or should they just focus on one or two courses and require students to take those so they get grounded? The downside for allowing all faculty members to integrate sustainability concepts at their own timeline and their own pleasure is that it can be thin, it can be spotty, uh, and you know perhaps that's not in the best service of the students. So we require definitely some leadership there and probably some supervision uh, for curriculum integration. At my own school, we have uh, one course here and it's the one I teach, Sustainable Business Practices. And uh, it's, it's been here for probably 10 years, I'd say. So there are other approaches too. Bodo is basically calling, you know, maybe there'd be subscription services for uh, colleges of business. So in other words, students that sign on for a couple of years and then get a degree, they sign on for maybe 10 years of programs. And so then they get many courses over those 10 years and it helps them keep up to date. And, you know, the world is changing rapidly with technology. So it, it does make sense. So there are other ways that curriculum could be integrated with, I guess, sustainability, many courses uh, coming online afterwards. Uh, with regards to, I, I think that critical uh, thinking is uh, endemic to uh, sustainability. It's, it's not a top-down uh, imposition of these ideas on people. There, there's a lot of elements involved with regards to taking a sustainable uh, approach to business. So I think it really requires people to understand things in a broad sense. And this is really the way I've structured my, my book here, Sustainable Marketing. So about they need to learn about markets and stakeholders, just like we've learned today. Also, uh, the roles of business in society and also the role of the state in society. And, uh, you know, the state is, plays a role as importantly as an umpire for business if nothing else, and business can't exist without a state because people are self-interested and there will be disputes and the court system at minimum is needed. There's also, uh, students need to understand factors that influence firms pursuing sustainability, such as globalization, uh, and also reactions to that protectionism and changing consumer preferences, a lot of that due to technology. Critical thinking also needs to be undertaken by just understanding sustainable marketing for the natural environment, how that can be done, and also for equity. So and in my book, there's a chapter on developing countries and also one, the final one on poverty alleviation. 
And it turns out that it's poverty alleviation because of there's so many reasons for poverty that it's there's not one silver bullet. There's uh, it really needs to the context needs to be considered to even have a chance of helping people uh, move out of poverty. There is a, a conscious capitalism simulation developed by uh, a friend, Ernie Kadat at the University of Tennessee. It's well done and it really does allow students to actually play against other teams, uh, student teams, or they can play against the computer. It definitely brings in the natural environment and decisions that firms would make with regards to the natural environment, some for uh, uh, local communities, but uh, there's more to be done there with regards to pedagogical tools for teaching sustainability. Okay, and as I close here, the Macro Marketing Society, uh, very uh, broad and eclectic. Uh, you probably feel comfortable there. We have uh, meetings all over the world. We only meet in North America once every three years. Uh, we met in 2017 in Queenstown, New Zealand. Uh, also, we're in Leipzig, Germany in 2018. We were in Cleveland. Actually, we had uh, our final event at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. In 2019, 2020, we were in Bogota and online, and we'll be online at a virtual uh, conference this year, uh, and that will be in July. The uh, special issues coming up are about luxury research and sustainability in non-weird countries, basically developing countries, and that's coming up here in the future. Okay, well, thank you for uh, uh, your time today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have now. I have one. Um, so I think, you know, within marketing and probably in business in general, we're hearing a lot now about machine learning, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, and just the increased digitization of consumption. So those are a lot of broad topics, but I'm just wondering if you could speak maybe broadly where there is a space for kind of macro marketing um, as a lens. Yeah. For understanding. Okay, great. Uh well, you know, we had a, a visitor here to our campus. It was actually in 2010. Her name is Felicity Beringer, and she's a writer for the New York Times, and she had covered environmental issues, basically. And one-on-one, -on -one I chatted with her, and I asked her directly, I said, would we even have uh, sustainability as we know it today without the internet? And she thought just a second and said, no, we really wouldn't. And the reason is, is that uh, a lot of these NGOs, environmentally oriented NGOs with a website and fundraising through the website, they can stay in the game. So they can stay active. They don't have to go out of business through a dry period of fundraising. Also, uh, inventors in small uh, businesses and uh, you know entrepreneurs, they can basically stay in the game and develop maybe a long tail for their product or service before the, uh, and allow things to uh, develop there favorably for them. So yes, definitely, I guess for the natural environment, it, uh, certainly the internet has had a, a focus there. I think there's a, an issue now and it's just emerging, although I think people have been writing about it for a number of years, but with the rise of social media, uh, this actually is, seems to be reinforcing tribalism. So you can people with extreme views can find each other and nurture each other. And, you know, it, it used to be that, you know, when I was a college student, there were three broadcast networks. And if you had something to say, you had to convince a reporter or a journalist connected with ABC, NBC, CBS to give you airtime. And then once you had airtime, you went away. <laughs> Maybe we're writing through newspapers. And so, uh, you know, we just, you know, the, the internet and tweeting has just changed things a lot. So uh, uh, it, I, I think that's definitely an issue. Also, uh, this comes up in my book, but there are in the developing world, there are places like in Mexico City, it also happened in North Macedonia in, uh, in 2016, uh, people that don't have jobs or are struggling, they can put up a website and start feeding basically fake news stories about anybody that they want. Donald Trump was a target in 2016 because he was controversial and people would read those things 
for and against him, but uh, they industrialize it. So they, the scale of it is, um, BuzzFeed did a, a piece on this a couple of years ago and they went to Mexico City and there's a guy there named Carlos Merlo and he owns, a, he's got a, a business that he's, he's probably a 20 something and he, uh, he has like 17 offices and each of the offices staff about 10 people, young 20 somethings with about eight or 10 computers and each, they, they create newspapers. And so these newspapers are out there and then they send bots to them. And so they'll present a story and then the bots will refer it. And then the uh, news integrators uh, like a Buzzfeed or a Reddit or some of these other integrators will pick up the story. And then you have mainstream media, even the New York Times running it as, hey, this is what's going on when actually it, it never happened or didn't happen that way. So, uh, and that, that's, that's a new phenomenon. And I think it's, it's just been really in the last five years, it's kicked in. So yes, definitely there's, you can see how society's use of, of social media has changed, but also it's driven by the Facebook model, which, and it used to be Google's ads model, which up till 2016 was any web page anywhere, if you can prove that you have visits or hits, they will pay you proportionately to place ads on your website according to how many hits you say and you can verify. So, so you can see how business and society have been influencing each other there. And there is this uh, outcome of, I guess, more, uh, more uh, tribalism in society. Mark, I have one question, and I have a meeting in seven minutes, so I'm going to leave. Uh, you know, if if we would say that our business school is at square one in terms of covering some of these themes, what would be your advice in terms of uh, how to move forward or a path forward? If we wanted to just really energize our curriculum a bit in, in this arena, what are some of the suggested first steps for a college like ours? Okay, great, that's a great question. And uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, well, having the, the Zoom call today is probably step one. So you're mm -hmm. beginning to uh, think about these things, which is great. You know, I would take it one step at a time, which would be, you know, target business sustainability 1.0 and maybe uh, see how you could approach uh, helping students understand how taking a, a broader approach and considering the natural environment, community issues could actually be beneficial to the bottom line for firms. So this is the business case. And although this would be regarded by maybe avant-garde sustainability people as weak sustainability, hey, most sustainability at business schools currently is weak sustainability. So it's uh, I, I think you just have to be comfortable with that. Uh, the book, Sustainable Marketing, I'm, I'm publishing here, it is written for skeptics of sustainability. And the reason I did that was because after teaching MBA students at my university, it was a required course. So when I talk to other teachers of sustainability, it's an elective. So they get all the people who want to learn about it. I got everybody, and that included. So I think my experience was probably similar to what uh, your student body is like at the MBA level or even the undergrad level that they, they want to know more that, you know, there's this hurdle of, you know, if we did it, would we ruin our business? And uh, I think the answer is, yeah, you, you need to make several steps, but um, it's, if you just, uh, and you can learn about it in my book. Uh, most sustainability books start off like on page one with climate change. And if you don't agree with, the author's view, you clearly are not, you know, high caliber student. Climate change comes up in my book, I think in chapter 10. So basically, if you understand, you know, how business can function in society and what else is going on in society, I think when you encounter uh, climate change, you'd be more ready to understand what your business could do with regards to climate change. You as a customer too. So uh, I, I guess that's what I would recommend. I, I think okay. you, you can give awards out to faculty member or students for coming up with 
neat achievements in the realm. And I guess just fanning the flames there. I, I would say for our, we have a PhD program and we we're one of the first to kind of put marketing and sustainable business practices. And that seems to attract uh, students that are interested in this. So I think that uh, it, it would create some momentum for you there to, you know, just uh, shoot for business sustainability. One dad out, what's the business case for it? What can we learn from firms like Walmart just alone? And I think Walmart would probably come alongside and help sponsor some programming for you. Okay. Because they are moving there. And so I, and I, that's the way I think I would to get going. Well, Mark, well, thank you. I, I can easily see how we would do sustainability in, uh, in our marketing PhD students, which I'm going to start encouraging. We have concentrations in management and business analytics, and this may be out of your wheelhouse, but got any ideas on what I can uh, do with those students and other concentrations? Yeah, no, well, actually, you know, I, I worked for two years in the marketing research industry after I got my PhD as a, they call it a methods consultant. It was, I was crunching numbers. So, uh, but uh, no, Joe, I, there, there are, and I think more data sets are coming out there. There's one called Sustainable Society Index it's based in Holland and it's, they, they keep it up to date. Uh, I've presented at uh, conferences with this. I've been published using this data in the journal Macro Marketing. So every country is evaluated on like seven dimensions or something like that. And you can get multivariate analysis going there. It's, it's really quite illuminating. You can focus just on uh, poor countries and see how they map there and uh, multidimensional scaling. Uh, that's just to start. There's also, uh, I guess, on the ground research I've done in place like Lebanon, where uh, nobody's really evaluated that uh, with survey research on the readiness or the willingness of customers to embrace sustainability. And what we're seeing is that certain religious groups that are more prone than others to embrace sustainability. Sunni uh, Muslims in Beirut are ahead of the other uh, religious groups there, and that includes Shia and Marianite Christians. And it has to do with their culture and I guess just what they see as being uh, making sense to them. So there are data sets like that. I think also the uh, maybe if you had a, a just choose the sustainable development goals assigned, let the students choose their own or randomly assign one of the goals to each of these and then have the students do some research on what companies are doing out there. And you find companies like Coca-Cola or they don't do anything without measuring it. So they are measuring it. So I, I think that's, that would be an approach I would take Joe, but there is a, I, I do appreciate your perspective. It's not readily there, but I think if you turn over a rock or two and I would be glad to help uh, you find some of these data sources, it would be there. Yeah. And, and also I, I think that the, uh, these are board issues for senior executives. And so they, they, would, they would engage. And I think you're, the people that you're getting in your program are talking to them or if not those people themselves. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, are there any other questions that we have? I just want to make uh, two shameless plugs. So as somebody who uh, has published in the Journal of Macro Marketing along with Alvin and also attended a Macro Marketing Society Conference, which was a delight, I encourage all of you to attend um, and to submit your work. And I really will say that the reviewer reviewing process in the Journal of Macro Marketing was one that really uh, helped us end with a better manuscript. So there was a lot of, I think, learning and a lot of time and effort that was clearly put in and love on the part of the reviewers and the editor. So uh, please, you know, keep those, those venues in mind. And Mark has uh, been a mentor and someone that I look up to in the field. You know, I'm in marketing because I think we can do work that saves the world. Um, and so I just appreciate the trail that you've blazed and continue to blaze in this arena. Thank you, thank you, Sheldon. I, I've enjoyed very much being with you all today. I, I look forward to staying in touch with you. 
All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.